study environmental science if you're not out in the environment. The William Scandling is a 65-foot research vessel that allows Hobart and William Smith students to study the physiological, chemical, biological, and geological properties of our very own Seneca Lake. We're really lucky in that we're one of the only undergrad institutions across the country that allows you know, students to go out on a research boat like that. Usually it's just graduate students and PhD students. For me, it's all about hands-on research. I love getting out of the classroom and going out in the field and getting that first-hand experience that you don't get sitting behind a desk or even sitting in a lab, really. It's just something you don't get in other parts of the country. You know, my academic advisor is Professor Halfman, and you see him walking around campus, you're not going to forget him. He really is a wealth of knowledge, and I found that that really pertains to a lot of the professors. And you go and sit down and talk with them in their offices, they are all extremely helpful and extremely welcoming, and they will guide you as long as you go and seek them. I'm back at HWS um, for a fifth year, and I'm getting my master's in teaching. The idea of community service is often seen as an extracurricular activity, but here at HWS, our approach is true to our name, service learning. Becoming engaged with the community is just part of who we are. I'm really excited next year I'm going to be doing Teach for America and I'm going to be heading back to New Orleans um, to work as a core member there. I found that by going out into the community, I gained so much more because I learned about new people. I made connections with people I might not have previously. And one of the greatest things I'll be leaving HWS with is kind of getting to know and value the sense of community that a place can offer. And I think the strongest reason for that is because of the service that I've learned. So I know that regardless of whether or not I'm going back home or I'm going to some place I've never been, I can kind of learn how to delve into the community and become a part of it. The total plane trip was about 22 hours. We were supposed to sleep on the plane and obviously we slept for like 30 minutes maybe. Over the Andes Mountains to Argentina. And then Hong Kong to Vietnam. And seeing the plane got down to the bottom of the continent of Africa was actually really surreal. And it was completely terrifying. Very nervous. The time slows crying my eyes out because I was so scared to go to this strange place for six months. There was so much excitement that I didn't really have time to be nervous about it. I was just like ready to get there. We did a lot of stuff and we went, did a lot of touristy things and we did a lot of local things. And When we were in the Mekong Delta, we ate field mouse. I played lacrosse in Ireland for the National University of Ireland at Galway. In Hanoi, we had a seven course snake meal. Stuck in traffic, uh, out of this van in front of me, suddenly two goats jump out. Pig's blood soup, I had pig's blood soup. Just standing on that top of the mountain looking all around you and you're in Patagonia, Argentina. Unreal. So wildly out of my element. Being in a different country away from your home with 20 other Americans, it's like you're, they become your family. I woke up in the morning and realized that I was happy to be where I was. You just don't know if when else in your life you're going to get to go back somewhere like that. Listen, if I can be put into an atmosphere where I can't communicate with anybody and still be able to cope, then I feel like I can communicate with anyone here. The abroad experience was probably the best experience of my life, and to have to say goodbye to that part of my life was the hardest part, I think. Students come in and we focus on assessment and really developing some clarity around their interests, values, and skills. And we really try to move them along, whether it's job shadowing, to initially find out what it is that they're interested in doing, then evolving that into internship experience, which is truly critical. We have events in New York City, in Washington, D.C., as well as Los Angeles. I owe the school and a uh a debt of gratitude in terms of what I got from it, in terms of education, and I really feel that it's you know it's a privilege for me to be able to help students. Whatever I've seen at Hobart Lane Smith, 
um, the school on a resume. I mean, I would interview someone. It's a small school. There's a sense of community, a sense of family, a shared experience. Really special. When you come from a school that's a lot smaller and more intimate, you just, it is more of a family feeling and you, and you do want to help more. You, you see these people around, professors still remember your names, you know, 20, 30 years out. Hobart and William Smith reached out and I think they stirred something in me that made me feel it was time to get back connected to the colleges. Cheers. Put those pads on and just jump right in it. I love everything about hockey. I love to skate. I love the physicality of it. I just, it's a good way to get my frustrations out. I just skate. <laughs> Playing on a club team is a lot less stressful than varsity. It's more relaxed. Everyone um, is just so friendly, laid back, and it's not so overwhelming that I can't do homework and still hang out with my friends and have a normal college experience at the same time. Since every was interested in the same thing it was really easy for us to just build a really tight relationship from there and the same goes for all the different groups and clubs on campus there's equestrian rugby alpine skiing arts collective debate fraternities dance you know pretty much anything you can think of overall it's really enhanced my college experience I chose HWS because of the interdisciplinary education and hands-on experiences. The opportunity to network with alums all over the country. The campus commitment to community service. I chose HWS because of its historic traditions and modern facilities. The diverse and international student body. 45 majors and 65 minors, but only one Mark Guerin. I chose HWS because of the friendly students and the beautiful campus championship caliber athletics, and clubs and intramurals open to everyone. The 11 to 1 student to faculty ratio. The hill, the quad, and the lake. You know, I chose HWS because, you know, it really allowed me to be who I am as a person. Because Geneva, New York, feels like home. How do you study environmental science if you're not out in the environment? The William Scandling is a 65-foot research vessel that allows Hobart and William Smith students to study the physiological, chemical, biological, and geological properties of our very own Seneca Lake. We're really lucky in that we're one of the only undergrad institutions across the country that allows you know, students to go out on a research boat like that. Usually it's just graduate students and PhD students. For me, it's all about hands-on research. I love getting out of the classroom and going out in the field and getting that first-hand experience that you don't get sitting behind a desk or even sitting in a lab, really. It's just something you don't get in other parts of the country. You know, my academic advisor is Professor Halfman, and you see him walking around campus, you're not going to forget him. He really is a wealth of knowledge, and I found that that really pertains to a lot of the professors. And you go and sit down and talk with them in their offices, they are all extremely helpful and extremely welcoming, and they will guide you as long as you go and seek them. I'm back at HWS um, for a fifth year, and I'm getting my master's in teaching. The idea of community service is often seen as an extracurricular activity, but here at HWS, our approach is true to our name, service learning. Becoming engaged with the community is just part of who we are. I'm really excited next year I'm going to be doing Teach for America, and I'm going to be heading back to New Orleans um, to work as a core member there. I found that by going out into the community, I gained so much more because I learned about new people. I made connections with people I might not have previously. And one of the greatest things I'll be leaving HWS with is kind of getting to know and value the sense of community 
that a place can offer. And I think the strongest reason for that is because of the service that I've learned. So I know that regardless of whether or not I'm going back home or I'm going to someplace I've never been, I can kind of learn how to delve into the community and become a part of it. The total plane trip was about 22 hours. We were supposed to sleep on the plane and obviously we slept for like 30 minutes maybe. Over the Andes Mountains to Argentina. And then Hong Kong to Vietnam. And seeing the plane got down to the bottom of the continent of Africa was actually really surreal. And it was completely terrifying. It's very nervous. The time slows crying my eyes out because I was so scared to go to this strange place for six months. There was so much excitement that I didn't really have time to be nervous about it. I was just like ready to get there. We did a lot of stuff and we went, did a lot of touristy things and we did a lot of local things. And When we were in the Mekong Delta, we ate field mouse. I played lacrosse in Ireland for the National University of Ireland at Galway. In Hanoi, we had a seven course snake meal. Stuck in traffic, uh, out of this van in front of me, suddenly two goats jump out. Pig's blood soup, I had pig's blood soup. Just standing on that top of the mountain looking all around you and you're in Patagonia, Argentina. Unreal. So wildly out of my element. Being in a different country away from your home with 20 other Americans, it's like you're, they become your family. I woke up in the morning and realized that I was happy to be where I was. You just don't know if one else in your life are going to get to go back somewhere like that. Listen, if I can be put into an atmosphere where I can't communicate with anybody and still be able to cope, then I feel like I can communicate with anyone here. The abroad experience of life is probably the best experience of my life, and to have to say goodbye to that part of my life was the hardest part, I think. Students come in and we focus on assessment and really developing some clarity around their interests, values, and skills. And we really try to move them along, whether it's job shadowing, to initially find out what it is that they're interested in doing, then evolving that into internship experience, which is truly critical. We have events in New York City, in Washington, D.C., as well as Los Angeles. I owe the school and a uh a debt of gratitude in terms of what I got from it in terms of education and I really feel that it's, you know, it's a privilege for me to be able to help students. Whenever I've seen a Hobart Lane Smith, um, the school on a resume, I mean, I would interview someone. It's a small school, there's a sense of community, a sense of family, a shared experience, really special. When you come from a school that's a lot smaller and more intimate, you just, it is more of a family feeling and you, and you do want to help more. You, you see these people around, professors still remember your names, you know, 20, 30 years out. Hobart and William Smith reached out and I think they stirred something in me that made me feel it was time to get back connected to the colleges. Cheers. Put those pads on and just jump right in it. I love everything about hockey. I love to skate. I love the physicality of it. I just, it's a good way to get my frustrations out. I just skate. <laughs> Playing on a club team is a lot less stressful than varsity. It's more relaxed. Everyone um, is just so friendly, laid back, and it's not so overwhelming that I can't do homework and still hang out with my friends and have a normal college experience at the same time. Since every was interested in the same thing, it was really easy for us to just build a really tight relationship from there. And the same goes for all the different groups and clubs on campus. There's equestrian, rugby, alpine skiing, arts collective, debate, fraternities, dance, you know, pretty much anything you can think of. Overall, it's really enhanced my college experience. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Welcome to the President's Forum. We're thrilled to welcome you here at a little bit different time, but a great opportunity to hear from a returning alumnus, Victor Simpson from the class of, of 63. Mr. Simpson's bio is before you, of course, has had this dazzling career as a journalist and uh, working as the Rome correspondent and bureau chief for 40 years, and as he says in the subject of, or title of his talk, Roman holiday, for 40 years as a foreign correspondent. 
He returned to campus uh, this weekend where he has been active with, uh, in classes, lecturing on WIOS, interviewing. We've worked, him, we've worked him very hard, and we're very grateful for his participation here. He has not been back for 50 years to campus. So when we met in my office, I said, 50 years? Was it something we said? I mean, what? <laughs> he assures me not. But as you can imagine, uh, living abroad and as a journalist and covering for popes and covering world events and serving in this very significant capacity, when you're back to the States and coming back here to Geneva, New York, was, had its own logistical complexities. Uh, but we are very grateful and very excited to have him here. I want to say, uh, in advance of bringing uh, Victor forth, uh, this is the last President's Forum of, of this semester. It's also the last President's Forum that my colleague Michael Hepp has coordinated. Michael serves as the Chief of Staff uh, in my office. And we announced to our Board of Trustees today that he has been poached, he has been uh, offered an exciting new position at Yale Medical School as the Chief of Staff to the Dean of Yale. So, as friends of the President's Forum, it's a good opportunity for, for me to acknowledge and to thank Michael Hupp for his uh, service. He's a graduate of the class of 05. I knew him since he was a student in my political science class in 2004, working for our rowing program, then residential education, and since 2008 in, in my office. So, Michael, we're going to embarrass you. Please stand and let us thank you for what you've done. Another reason for this Harvard graduate to hate Yale. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, today, tonight we have the chance to talk to uh, a really interesting person who's been at the center of policy issues and politics, from world events to the geopolitical nature of the Vatican to other central and broadly European issues. Someone who knows us well, someone who can speak to issues of media, communication, world events. We have a lot to talk about. So let's bring forth our distinguished graduate and welcome him back to his alma mater, Mr. Simpson. Victor, thank you. Mr. President, students, faculty, and friends. 50 years, by any standards, is a long time since I last stepped foot on the campus of Hobart and William Smith Colleges. But driving here yesterday, coming up through the Finger Lakes, seeing those familiar names, Canandaigua, Kiuka, Horseheads, right, made me feel right at home again. I'm sure that the quad that I remember is still alive with students playing touch football once the snow melts. In the fall, the expectations of the first winter snow and the electricity of a Hobart-Syracuse lacrosse game. Over these 50 years, we've been through nine presidents in Washington and three wars of which they have been more or less responsible for. During this period, Hobart has lived a revolution. When I was a student, two years of ROTC, Air Force variety, was mandatory for all Hobart men. Chapel was also compulsory, a reminder of Hobart's Episcopalian roots students would fill out little cards as proof of attendance. But today, I have to say we did have an advantage, you know? Today's party goers have to wait a little longer to party because when I was here, the drinking age was 18 and New York State moved it up to 21, I know. Audrey Hepburn, the actress, made her film debut playing a European princess who slipped away from our entourage 
while on an official visit to Rome. She wanted to find out how the common people lived. She met Gregory Peck, an American newspaper man who fell for her and promised not to give her secret away. The film, called Roman Holiday, came out in 1953. Ten years later, I graduated from Hobart College. I can't say that I dislike the image of a dashing newspaper man <laughs> tooling around Rome on a Vespa with a glamorous princess sharing the seat with me. <laughs> but I confess, it wasn't exactly planned, right? That 10 years after I began my great adventure, a four decade long Roman holiday would, would, would roll out that sent me in pursuit of princes, popes and presidents, dictators and other demons around the world. As a foreign correspondent for the Associated Press, and the agency's chief of bureau in Italy, I made some 100 trips with Popes John Paul II and Benedict XVI. I covered wars in the Middle East and Cyprus as, and was a witness to history in places as diverse as Jerusalem and Belfast. I retired a year ago shortly after covering the election of the new Pope, whose mere selection of the name Francis has given hope to those Catholics seeking change in the church and nightmares to those fearing he might just do that. Francis of Assisi, patron saint of Italy, and known for challenging the conven conventional wisdom in the Middle Ages, is considered the saint of the poor. No pope had ever taken his name before. I'd like to think that in some small way, I had a hand in the momentous events that swept the Vatican a year ago. Back in the fall of 2012, I traveled to Beirut with Pope Benedict XVI. When you go with the Pope, there were about 50 journalists who accompany him, and we're all sitting in the back of the plane, and I said, I always like to make plain, journalists actually, we pay for the flight, right? Should there be any question that the Vatican is, you know, taking us along for the ride? No, journalists pay for the seat. I said, no. And all the, you know, we realize that we are subsidizing the, the, the flights because I'm sure the Vatican entourage gets comped by Alitalia. No? <laughs> but, we're, we're, but there we are. So, Back in 1912, I was aboard the Pope's plane, Pope Benedict's plane, returning from a trip to Beirut, Lebanon. At the time of the Lebanon trip, I had put in my retirement notice to the Associated Press, setting the date for February 28th, 2013, and informing the Vatican that this would be my last papal trip. In recognition of my years covering the Vatican, papal aides escorted me up the aisle of the Middle East airline plane shortly after we took off from Beirut for a private farewell to Pope Benedict. I sat beside him and shook his hand. He was very tired, obviously he had a stressful three days in Beirut, but he had nonetheless congratulated me on my upcoming retirement and asked me how many years I covered the Vatican. He seemed surprised when I told him at least 30. He looked and sounded weary that during a trip that was made amid rising tensions in the reason caused by the civil war in neighboring Syria. But he did seem pleased with the conversation. He said my retirement was, quote, well-deserved making me later wonder if, in his thoughts, he drifted to the momentous plans that he was planning to unveil on the world at a later date. There's no way to tell. The encounter, however, did not prepare me for a stunning announcement five months later that he planned to retire on February 28th, 
the exact same day that I had chosen, right? It was not my first close encounter with a pope while airborne. Back in 1986, returning from a two-week trip to Bangladesh, Singapore, Fiji Islands, New Zealand, Australia, and the Seychelles, no American president traveled like this, uh, I was asked to join John Paul II for dinner in his upstairs cabin of the Qantas 747. I was terribly embarrassed at the way I looked. Lots of stubble from having taken off from Perth, Australia at dawn that morning, and in a sloppy safari jacket that had been soaked by a monsoon during a stopover in the Seychelles. It's funny the thing one thinks about at such moments. My wife always hated that jacket, and I imagined her saying, you wore that to dinner with the Pope? <laughs> no? No? With a twinkle in his eye, the Pope put me at ease. I apologized for what I called my working clothes. He gripped his white robes and shot back at me, these are my working clothes. Yeah, it was very nice. Watching such an important person from my privileged position, it's amazing what one learns. I saw, for instance, that this pope, that pope, suffered fools badly. We were joined at dinner by a papal aide and Australia's ambassador to Italy, who was hitching, ambassador to the Holy See, excuse me, who was hitching a ride back to Rome. I soon found myself in the middle of a diplomatic incident. The Qantas steward came over and brought a basket of wine to the table. Two whites and two reds, I remember this, a little straw basket, and the ambassador grabbed a bottle and announced we would be having that wine. He said, this is a good Australian red. The Pope stared at him and said, I don't drink red wine. I wanted white. It's like that, no? And that was the beginning of a series of backs and forth between this ambassador and the Pope that the Pope just really just took, took an immense dislike to this man. But, but using me as a foil because he would, he would say, for example, um, who do you think Australians resemble more, Americans or British? And I would say, oh, well, I, think the, I think more Americans than the... And the ambassador would say, no, no, British, British, British. And the Pope said, this Mr. Simpson, he's right, Americans, no, 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 no. And, the, and went to Hobart. And the whole, the whole meal unfolded that way. It was terrible. I, the man was destroyed. I don't know if he, <laughs> if, he, if he could have parachuted off the plane, I think he would have by the time we got that, right? It's interesting how much attention the Vatican gets. Now... There are one billion Roman Catholics in the world, almost as many as there are Muslims. But still, you know, most news media don't write about other religions the way they write about the Vatican. Obviously, it's, since it's an institution, it makes itself much more, much more easy to write about, you know. And it wants to be written about, and it wants to act like an institution. So therefore, it has to be careful what it does. Of course, it's difficult writing about the Vatican, but you, know, like, you just can't stroll around like you can the Hobart campus onto the... You can't walk into the Vatican without a pass. You need a pass for everything. Now, they have a pharmacy in the Vatican in which they sell medicines which they don't sell in Italy, but you can't, if you'd like to buy, go, you must come with your prescription, and the Swiss guards will look at your prescription and see if we get it or not, right? And they also have a commissary where they sell tax-free things, and Italians are always trying to get on that list. Right? Save money on the taxes. Yeah. Aside from the 492 residents and nearly 4,700 employees, everyone needs to get in to even the most minor thing. Therefore, you know, it makes getting information difficult. And ordinarily, you know, why do you get information? 
You chat up people, you see this man, talk to this politician here and there. Different world. Different world. Still, the news gets out, and generally, I have to say, some of the news that gets out is of a, you know, what do we say, a scandalous nature, mysterious nature, you know? Let me take one step back and say, the Vatican is in Italy. Therefore, most of the people who work at the Vatican are Italian. And therefore, it is subject to the same quicksand of quagmire that happens when you try to get information, and you try to decide what is happening on the Italian political scene, or the Italian historical scene, or the Italian criminal scene. Just one big, big quicksand. Get dug in, right? Yeah. An example of several interesting items from Vatican or Vatican news over the last 30 years, right? There was the deranged Hungarian painter walked into St. Peter's Square, St. Peter's Basilica, and took a hammer to Michelangelo's Pietà. No? Knocking off the head. The restored masterpiece now sits behind bulletproof glass, no? It's always unclear to how, despite all the guards they have, the man got in, especially with a large hammer. Then there was the bloody case of the death of the commander of the Swiss guards and his wife. They lived in a Vatican apartment, and it was discovered by a Vatican official that in the early evening, about 10 years ago, The body of the Swiss guard, of the commander, his wife, and a corpse man were on the floor of the apartment. The unusual slain, three dead, inside the Vatican, produced endless speculation. Some said the commander was actually an agent of the East German Stasi secret police. Others that the corpse man was having an affair with the commander's wife, or perhaps the commander himself. Did we ever get the truth? An independent version of the truth? An in-house investigation produced a prosaic explanation. The young Swiss guard was disgruntled after failing to receive a promotion. Yeah. So he went ahead and killed the two and then took his own life. Now, who could, is, was there anyone there who could contest this? No, because the Vatican city state is a independent country. No, there was no outside investigation possible. And I know that the mother of the 19 year old Swiss guard who, who, who involved in this incident went to the Pope demanding he do something to find out what really happened. Just a, it's another one of those mysteries that is now, you know, in, into, the, into the Italian quicksand. My own fascination with the Vatican began in 1978. It is known as the year of three popes. That was a tumultuous year in Italy because in March of that year, gunmen from the Red Brigade's terrorist group kidnapped Aldo Moro, at the time Italy's most important politician. They killed his five bodyguards while taking Moro away. Moro was held for 55 days as a terrorist vainly called on the Italian government to release terrorist prisoners in exchange for Moro's life. They refused. Finally, after 55 days, Moro's body, riddled with bullets, was found in a car parked in downtown Rome. It was found parked right near the offices of two, Italy's two major political parties at the time, the Christian Democrats and the Communists. It was also right near, if I may add, the offices of the Associated Press. <laughs> The car was parked near an espresso bar, which I frequented on a nearly daily basis. The owner was so frightened that he had seen the car parked there that he would, vowed never to talk about it and never to mention that he had seen this. 
and begged me not to say that I knew he had seen this, right? He lived in absolute fear. Because, you know, at the time, the Communist Party, while extremely powerful in Italy, getting about 30% of the vote, was not allowed by mutual, by consent of the other parties to enter government. The United States actually led the call on, on Italy not to let the, let the communists be in any governing coalition, and the other parties went along with it. So the terrorists sort of interrupted an ongoing political process which the, you know, the second largest party in the country could never govern. And um, that, no. so again, there are those who said the colleagues of Aldo Moro actually let him die. They decided he was not, he, he, was, he was better dead than alive. Right? Because he was interested in bringing the communists into government at last. Right? Do we know? Again, Italian quicksand. We'll never find out. Right? Moving on in that year, in August of that year, Pope Paul VI died, and the College of Cardinals, as they had done for 455 successive years, elected an Italian cardinal to replace him. Albino Luciano was then the, art, the patriarch of Venice. He took the name John Paul I. The church and the world would soon be shocked. After only 33 days, the new pope, John Paul I was found dead in his bed. The circumstances were unclear, some would say mysterious. The Vatican first said the body was discovered by a male aide and that copies of a religious tract were found beside him. Weeks later, it emerged they lied. The body of the Pope was actually found by a nun clearly an embarrassment to the Vatican mindset at the time, and that the Pope was actually reading the balance sheets of the Vatican's controversial bank that had been implicated in affairs with the Mafia. No? Again, no? Do the mysteries ever end, right? But, amazingly, the cardinal electors then took a revolutionary step. They stunned the world with their choice of a successor to the dead pope. They chose a non-Italian, choosing a Polish cardinal, Karol Wojtyła, in a challenge to the Soviet bloc at the height of the Cold War. Now, it's hard sitting around here today to know that the Europe was divided in two at the time. It's, you know, the Soviet East and the democratic West and West. You know? And it looked like it would be forever. No one thought the, you know, thought the Soviet, the Soviet conquests after World War II were forever. In fact, though, Soviet fears about the election of Karol Wojtyla were well-founded. It turns out he led a peaceful revolution across Europe that would spell the end of communist regimes. In his book, former Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev gave full credit to John Paul for his role in bringing down the Soviet Empire. How did he do it? By going to his homeland and encouraging workers to form a, la a free labor union. The idea of a free labor union in the East Bloc was unheard of. And he started a revolt. So much so that at a certain point, the um, Polish government declared martial law and imprisoned the leaders of the labor union. It was at that time that back in Rome, it looked like revenge was enacted. Pope John Paul was shot in St. Peter's Square during a general audience. It's in 1981. Again, they arrested the, they arrested the Italian police, arrested the gunman, no, a Turkish man, and who, who told them that he was working on behalf 
of the Bulgarian secret police. They arrested the Italians arrested the chief of the Bulgarian airline in Rome and charged two other Bulgarians back in Bulgaria in, a, with a, in absentia with attempted murder. It was all done, the Bulgarian connection was all done on the basis of what the gunman said. There was a trial and he contradicted himself continuously and the Bulgarians were found not guilty for lack of evidence. Hmm? That was 1981. Has there ever been another person brought forth in the case? No. Huh? He, the man has contradicted himself said he wasn't really telling the truth when he said it was the Bulgarians, claiming that Western Secret Services put him up to it, to saying it. We'll never know. It's just part of this continual, these continual stories that in Italy, there's mysteries buried under a sand, sand somewhere. It's fascinating. As a journalist trying to get this information, you know, you could, you know, one can spend my life as I've spent my you know, 40 years trying to get, right? I think I should say, you know, I want to, I, I, I'd like to say a good word about things one covers. You know, people, we don't only write negative news, which sometimes we're accused of, no? That the world is made up not only of scoundrels, but of people who do heroic deeds, you know, that uh, others would uh, shy from doing. And I really want to say one of them, a standout to me in this, was Egyptian leader Anwar Sadat. In 1977, with Egypt and Israel in a state of war, he decided in a little more than a week to make an historic visit to Jerusalem in an attempt to break the deadlock. In doing so, he gave the Israelis something they desperately craved, recognition from the Arabs or an Arab leader. And he got back his land that had been taken by the Israelis in the 1967 war. It was a remarkable scene, an absolutely remarkable scene, as he stepped off his plane and was greeted by politicians and generals who had long been his enemy. Even the most hardened journalists had to be moved at this scene. You know, I remember Golda Meir, the Prime Minister, uh, Moshe Dayan, this famous Israeli officer with a patch over one eye. They were there at the foot of the plane as Sadat came off and just shook up the Middle East overnight. The Middle East was shaken overnight. Sadat signed a peace treaty with Israel. I said he got back his land, and that peace treaty still holds after all these years. The Israelis and the Egyptians have never traded a shot since then. Relations are not great, but this, as I say, they still have relations. But Sadat paid with his life. He was assassinated by, by the members of the Egyptian military who didn't like his, his, his relay, moving towards a relations with uh, the hated, hated Israel. I was there when the Israeli Prime Minister, Menachem Begin, paid a visit to Sadat. We went to the, it was in the city of Ishmaelia on the Suez Canal, and all the buildings were pockmarked, pockmarked by bullets from previous wars. So it shows that, you know, there are, you, one can be optimistic, there can be peace, but it needs the two sides to do it, and that requires courage, right? You must give up something to get something, right? Certainly, John Paul II was courageous. He, he, he knew he was risking his life when he went up against the Soviets you know, to bring democracy to, his, to Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe. Huh? There are always these wonderful stories. And then I think of another story that I covered, which should have been wonderful, but it, you know, it, it, it turned out badly 
And um, I'll tell you, because I was accused in this story of being, of mistreating an American hero. A man named Capecchi, an American of Italian origin, won the Nobel Prize for Medicine four years ago, I think it was, five years ago. And when he won this prize, the Nobel Committee issued this citation saying this man led the most extraordinary life. Because he had told everybody, he had told, he had given interviews about growing up in wartime Italy, being separated from his mother, living on the streets of Italy by himself at the age of six and seven, while his mother was deported to a concentration camp in Germany, just for being an American. So my editors in New York called me after this happened. They said, this is wonderful stuff. This is really heroic material. I mean, it's really heart-wrenching material. Could you do a profile on him? I said, I'd be glad to. That's when I began really looking into his past. And I discovered that he made up the whole story. His mother was never put in, any, in a concentration camp. Right? He didn't live on the streets of Italy. He actually, you know, escaped it. He left for Italy with his mother without any threats whatsoever. So at first, the Associated Press was a little reluctant. I mean, you know, we, we have you feel it? So we have to talk to him. What does he say about it? He was back in Salt Lake City. We was teaching at the University of uh, Salt Lake. And we, our bureau in um, Salt Lake did an interview with him. And which, after initially hedging and hoaring, he confessed. He said, he said, I didn't make this up. I was told this story by my uncle was his story, right? And uh, so, we went with the story. Two things happened. One, I, I got these terrible letters accusing me of destroying an American hero. When all I was doing was searching for the truth. Going for the truth. And the, even more, remar more remarkable in a concrete terms, he had a sister who nobody knew about who read the article in an Austrian newspaper and tracked him down and they were reunited. Or you re I shouldn't say reunited, they were united. So, you know, I was doing what a, what a, you know, what a journalist is supposed to do, if you'd like, you know. Make some attempt at the truth, expose hypocrisy in the world, you can't ask for anything more. Yeah. So, you know, we don't rely on uh, national security, you know, tapes and things like that as journalists. We have to use our limited means. Like that. No. No. Looking back, I realized that I was part of a golden age of journalism. When plentiful resources allowed me and other colleagues to travel the world to keep our readership informed. We know that's not entirely true today. Because, you know, newspapers are suffering terribly from drops in advertising. They're having a hard time keeping up with the new media. People don't just don't, don't, people just don't buy newspapers anymore. They don't, they'll read it online if they, need, if they read anything. However, this doesn't mean there's no room for journalists. Probably journalists are more important than ever because the, it, we can't have our citizenry satisfied with a, you know, a little 130-word uh, story or a seven-word tweet. There is always, with a will, always be a need for solid journalism. You know? And we must uh, you know, encourage our students, these students, you, yourselves, others, you know, to pursue in a most serious fashion Journalism. As I said, today I spoke to a, a class of was um, studying op-ed journalism. And I said, you, you people who are actually going to express your opinions have to be more than ever certain of what you're talking about is correct. 
You have a particular burden since you are attempting to sway people to your side. Particular burden, tell it like it is. That goes across for all, you know, television journalists, whatever. Serious, basic journalism is needed. And it is, you know, the backbone of, you know, our Western civilization, if you will. Hmm? It'll be up to you people who, you know, the coming generations to make sure that um, readership of newspapers or news is not an anachronism. It's very, very, very important it's going to all be for you. I'm looking back at the various stories I covered. I mean, they've just been in, 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 incredible, and I feel I've, my life has been enriched by it. And, you know, I think that um, my readers have benefited. For example, I went to Northern Ireland because an a Irish nationalist by the name of Bobby Sands was on a hunger strike protesting British rule, and he starved himself to death you know, in the Mays prison in Belfast. I went to Israel to cover the Israeli invasion of, um, of Lebanon, southern Lebanon, 1982, and I'll never forget Ariel Sharon, who's then the defense minister, said, we'll be out in a week. Huh? I think, you know, I think they were in, the Israelis were in southern Lebanon for 20 years. Well, so much for the week. But if we didn't have journalists to report this to you, you, know, you have to depend on advocates, and that's a very dangerous business to depend on advocates for your news. So you must demand, we all must demand, that our means of information produce solid journalism. And I really hope that at least some of you do become, and I don't expect all of you, but some of you do become journalists to pursue a career that, you know, is, you know, while it sometimes beats working being a journalist, no, it is vitally important for all of us and uh, in this world. So that's Uh, oh, thanks very much. That was uh, fabulous. Um, I wondered how, I'll start with a hard one, I guess. I wondered how you dealt with the um, pedophile crisis in the Catholic Church when you were chatting with the Pope. Uh, a valid question. And when I chatted with the Pope, the, which, the Benedict, right? I didn't think it was the moment to bring up the pedophile crisis. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, though, I mean, it was the, at another moment it would have been. But, you know, I'll tell you something. Um, I, I remember, on, this is not the pedophile crisis, but, you know, we're straight on. It's not that we ever held back on any of our reporting going to, going to Africa with Benedict, right? We got up and we asked him, you know, we're headed to Africa where the AIDS epidemic is terrible. Going, to, We were flying to Cameroon. Well, well, you know, are you prepared? What Catholic doctrine says you don't use condoms. What are you, what are you going to do about this? Right? So he's right to his face. And you may not like his answer. And a lot of people didn't like his answer, but this was his answer. Condoms don't help the problem. They only exacerbate it. Hmm? Going, on to, going on to explain because, you know, just, you know, Just opening up the field of sexuality to people, young people should know better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, it's, not, it's not that we, don't, we didn't ask at, a, at an appropriate moment. It would have been inappropriate for me, for this, you know, sitting down saying goodbye to him. By the way, how come you didn't do more on pedophile? You know, honestly, huh? How did you deal with reporting? Oh, we reported fully. We went, we went after the Vatican, you know, in a balanced way all the time. As, you know? We we're all, perhaps we we're all late in coming to it, and you know. And as I, I said to someone who asked me, I, clearly John Paul wasn't on his radar screen. You no, know? the question about it. He had another priority. 
Mistake, obviously. No, nobody's excusing them. But it's not that we, the news media, didn't deal with it. We surely did. We still. Are. Ah, I have to say, to the, the BBC, please, BBC, very important. I have to say the New York Times is still a leading news organization. I, you know, I mean, um, not really, I don't think so, no, I, I wouldn't think, I wouldn't say so. I would really, you might not lock it, and I might not lock it, but certainly News Corporation is a leading news organization. That's Rupert Murdoch. Uh, can't deny it. And all major clients of the AP, so I have to say, right? <laughs> we just don't. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I have two papal questions. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask. Um, the hard one first. Is Pope Francis continuing the papal tradition of wearing red Prada shoes? No. Oh, great. He wears very simple black shoes. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank what's, you. What's the other one? The other one is, in your work with the AP, I, I understand that you report. Has there been an op-ed angle for you in that? Uh, yeah, well, certainly, you know, we write uh, analysis and opinion pieces. No, we do. Right. I, I think maybe we're a little uh, more careful to be as balanced as possible and while we understand laying out the issues in a, you know, I, I ask without this, being partisan. Yeah, because um, John Paul II in my family is known as J.P. Deuce uh, and Benedict both went to Africa and both did this business about AIDS and condoms. Yeah. And I don't understand why there wasn't an uprising in the press, in the op-ed press, about that being a positively criminal position. You can say what you want about encouraging or discouraging sexual activity, yeah. but people died of AIDS because of the lack of condoms. Yeah. And that position of those repressive governments was supported by those popes. What can I can say, I mean, I think they're also reported by the U.S. government at times, no? Under George Bush, had very serious restrictions on contraceptives. Yes. And on the AI, USAID, no? I mean, we report all these things. I'm, you know, we, you know, we can't move members of Congress to, you know, they have to, you know, we can't, you know, we can't push, they have to make their own decisions. They see what we write. As I said, the whole world we are we are flying to Africa when this pope, when the Pope made the comments about condoms. He arrived. The U, the UN World the World Health Organization the UN World went been berserk at what he said about AIDS not being worsening the situation, not bettering. It. So, no, and I guess people in the Catholic Church, uh, you know, they walk away from it. If they're Catholics. That's not, you know, they just walk away from it. As we know, for example, when it comes to contraception. Any poll will show you that the level of contraception used by Catholics is equal to that of non-Catholics. So, so, so much for that ban. No? Yes, ma'am. I'm just wondering what your take is now on the Amanda Knox trial. Oh. What happened? What my take is? Well, having carefully, unfortunately, having had to carefully follow this case, you know, uh, I'm not sure whether she's guilty or innocent. I'm not sure. So, okay. I would say that uh, in America, she probably would have been protected by double jeopardy standards. And which, and what happened was she was convicted, and then, then she was absolved by an appeals court. Right. Then the prosecution came right back and indicted her again, and in the next trial, she was convicted again. That could be double jeopardy. Right. There is a slightly gray error because it was an appeals court. In any case, she's going to face as one. She has one last judgment to come. We'll see if it absolves her again or affirms the sentence. And then is uh, the question is, 
That question to ask to the U.S. government, not to me. Will the U.S. extradite her to Italy? Now, we did a piece, and we spoke to Alan Dershowitz, who was the leading expert on the international law and criminal indictments, and he said yes, the U.S. would it would yeah, because the U.S. demands other countries always demands other countries to extradite suspects to them always, particularly you know drug dealers, uh, terrorist suspects, but big big drugs. They're always demanding the other they comply. So how could they not comply with one of Italy, America's closest allies, Italy? How about, is she, is she, I, I, you know, I really don't know what she's innocent or guilty. She performed badly. Perhaps any young woman would under those circumstances, no? When, a, when initially questioned, um, she didn't handle herself terribly well, but who knows how I would be at that age in a strange language at the time for her, no? So, uh, it is a case that has fascinated the Italians as much as Americans, I can assure you. And we've, you know, devoted... We, we have covered every session of all her trials. Thank you, Victor. Um, could you speak to the, the press angle of the contemporary situation where there's been a critique of particularly CNN, but other coverage of its coverage of the Malaysian Airlines um, story, as important and tragic as it is, with the evolving events in Crimea, in Ukraine, and kind of the proportionality of the news. You, I take the point you write what's out there, but the press also privileges the order that we as consumers and readers see and read it. And I wondered if you had any reflections on that and then the tensions that exist within the media as a business and I do because I actually had this debate at home with my wife who, <laughs> who she's also a journalist by the way who, who was very is very upsetting that in the initial stages I can't believe how much coverage she said given to this, right and I said I'll be supposed to, you know it's kind of really you know it's kind of love this kind of thing mystery it's a mystery you no know, missing Ellen etc but as day and time has gone by, and day after day, you know, such important news orders as the New York Times report writing the same story. You know, I saw in today's Times, the research resumed today or something. You know, had I written that five years ago about a search for something resuming, my editor in New York said, well, it's not a story, the search is resuming. Where's the news, all right? There is absolutely no news in what people are writing. They're writing speculation, no more, no less. Nobody knows anything. At the same time, we have a very complicated geopolitical crisis, I grant. It's very complicated. You know, it's complicated just reading the history of the Ukraine by trying, trying to discern how, you know, how Russian should the Crimea be or not. It's complicated, I grant, no? It doesn't mean that we can not do our jobs and we can dismiss it. It's just too difficult to tell. I do think at this point we're giving much too much coverage to this plane. And too little coverage to the Crimea. I really, I agree. I do. And the the reason is because it's a hard story. It's, or... a, it's much too hard to tell. Oh. That's the reason. Not because the other is a great story. The, other, the Ukraine story is much too hard. Americans don't even know who the Ukraine is. Forget the Crimea. You know? I hate to say that, but it's it's really true. I mean, I find it both interesting, but the, it is sort of a okay. Any other questions? Right there in the back west. Uh, because so many people, oh, wow, this is loud. Uh, because so many people look for news organizations to keep updated on what is a really unique religious figurehead, the uh, the, the Pope, um, have you ever felt conflicted on reporting on any reporting you've had to do? Uh, because essentially, what they read can affect how they view and connect with their religious organization. Well, I've had restrictions on my reporting. <laughs> have you ever felt conflicted about it? I certainly have had no restrictions on my report. Well, <laughs> personal, my personal view, um, because. <laughs> 
because news organizations can have a lot of power over how people, especially with the papacy, uh, view their religious organization, have you ever felt conflicted over anything uh, the, the news organization that you've, you represent has had to publish? And that's one thing what makes the AP a great news organization. We don't benefit. Mr. Simpson, do, do you think we will see women priests or married priests in the near future? I think we'll see married priests sooner than we'll see women. It's running, they are just running out of priests. I think, you know, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry. You know, the Eastern branch of the Roman, the Eastern branch of the Catholic Church, you know what I mean by, everyone know what I mean by the Eastern branch? Like the Ukrainian Catholic Church is the Eastern branch, or the Melkite Church in Lebanon is the Eastern branch, or the, um, the main um, church, Catholic, um, the main Catholic presence in Lebanon, they're all Eastern right branches. They have married clergy. They're Catholics, but with married clergy. No, the clergy cannot become bishop, but they all have married priests. And um, they are under the Pope. They, they give their obedience. These churches, as opposed to the Orthodox, give their obedience to the Pope. And they have married clergy. So there's no doctrinal block on that. It's tradition. And I think, I, th I think it'll happen. You know, they've, admit, they've been admitting, I don't know if you know that, they've been admitting Anglic married Anglican clergy in England to, to the Catholic Church, all right? Married Anglican clergy who are dissatisfied with the Anglican Church. They've been admitting them into the Roman Catholic Church. So it's another example. Well, we give you a Hobart and William Smith tie for your next audience with the Pope. <laughs> Get the word out there to Francis uh, with our thanks uh, for your engagement here and um, for your career. To the students, I would say to you especially, this is a, a graduate who a few years ago was sitting on this campus and thinking about his own life and has forged a very interesting career uh, for 40 years living in Rome, as we've said, and really reporting on uh, current events in a really interesting way. And it's a privilege to welcome you back to campus. Thank you all for joining us. We, um, we invite anyone who would like to join us for a uh, reception in the common room where Victor will be there to continue the conversation for some, for some food and, and dinner. So please, please join us right next door in the common room. That's terrific. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Nicely done. Now that was right. Watch it right up on